this visual analogy that I'm going to share with you right now is what we've developed as a way of helping pe- to make it more tangible for people, I suppose. So the visual analogy concept that we developed is that everybody has a mental illness jar, right? So in the, in the context of today's conversation, we can think about this as being a bipolar jar, if you want, okay? So every single person has one of these jars, right? Everybody. It doesn't matter whether you have bipolar or not. We've all got a jar. And that um, for each of us, there are different kinds of factors that we can use to fill our jar. So in this picture on the right, you can see that we're representing genetic, genetic vulnerability factors that we were just talking about with little orange balls. And on the left, we're representing that environmental or experience stuff that we were talking about with these little blue uh, pyramids, I guess they are. Yeah. Let's call them pyramids. And uh, so this this beautiful image was developed by my brother, who is a wonderfully talented oh. artist kind of person. <laughs> anyway, so the idea is that you can, the both of these types of factor can can be added into your jar over time, right? That's what this this set of images is showing. So that if we look first at the jar all the way to the far right, you can see that it's full all the way to the top. And in our analogy, when your jar is filled all the way to the top, that's when we experience an active episode of some kind of mental health problem, like bipolar, right? So this could be, this full jar could be representing an episode of mania or hypomania, or it could be representing an episode of depression. Okay. So if your jar is full, you're experiencing an active episode of illness of some kind. So there's a couple of things I want to like make sure I point out to you here. One is that the, as you can see, the amount of orange balls in the jar stays the same over time. And that reflects what we know from reality, which is the amount of genetic stuff we have when we're born is what we're stuck with. We can't change it. Right. Uh, It's just what it is. But we will all have some. That's a really important point. We'll talk about that in a minute, maybe. But we all have some. So it's not just people who have bipolar who have some of this genetic vulnerability. But what changes over time is the amount of that blue pyramid business in the jar, right? So that can accumulate over time as we experience things in our lives, you know, like those, for example, stressful life events that we were just talking about. That would be an awesome example of something that can add um, blue pyramids into your jar. And so at a certain point, if you get to the point where your jar fills up, that's when somebody will experience a first active episode of illness. Got it. Cool. So far. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to move on to the next bit, which is just what it kind of gets at what we were just talking about, which is that you can have, so it doesn't matter how your jar fills up. Your, if your jar fills up, then that's when you experience an active episode of a psychiatric thing like bipolar, right? So if we look at the two jars on the very far right, you can see that the top one has relatively large amount of the orange balls in it, the genetic stuff and a smaller amount of the blue pyramids, the environmental stuff, whereas the one on the bottom is exactly flipped. Little Mm -hmm. bit of genetic stuff, large amount of environmental stuff. And this reflects exactly what we know happens in reality, is that people develop bipolar disorder as a result of different relative contributions of genetic stuff and environmental or experiential stuff. Right. right? Mm -hmm. The couple of things I want to point out really explicitly here is that, see that set of top three jars where we start out with just the balls and then the middle picture is where there's just a few of the Mm -hmm. pyramids in there Mm -hmm. you can get to that point and go no further right so it doesn't even if you've got a lot of those orange balls in your jar doesn't Mm -hmm. mean you're doomed doesn't mean that your jar has to fill up and you will definitely develop bipolar it doesn't mean that at all right might mean is that maybe you have a higher chance than the person at the bottom Mm-hmm. Right. So, so maybe you have a higher chance for your jar to fill up. Maybe you would have, maybe it would be symptoms emerging at a younger age. Right. right. Those mm-hmm. just take mm-hmm. less time for the jar to fill up, that kind of thing. Right. But for basically everybody has a chance to develop something like bipolar disorder. It's not just people who have, who have already experienced the diagnosis. Hang on a second. This is, this is what I'm trying to represent with this picture here. Look. So it's showing that in the population, you know how like 
if we were to get everybody listening to this podcast today um, to line up according to how tall we are, there would be some people who would be like really tall. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call really tall is over six foot three because I'm not really tall. I'm mm-hmm. less than five foot three, right? <laughs> I, I so you'd you'd end up with like a small number of people like this little group down here, right? Who would be really tall, and you'd end up with a small group of people down here who would be really short. I would be in this group, right? But most people are somewhere between five foot three and six foot three, right? right? That's what mm-hmm. this is representing. This is most people, mm-hmm. but and that same concept holds true for how much genetic vulnerability we all have to mental illness. There's going to be some people who have a lot in their jar to begin with. Mm-hmm. There's going to be some people who have very little in their jar to begin with, but most of us are going to be somewhere in this intermediate, moderate range. Right. And so it just depends what happens to us during our lifetime that determines whether or not our jar fills up and we experience an active episode of illness. So people will often say to me, you know, well, how do I have bipolar? Because I know that it's, people will say, I know it's genetic, but there's nobody else in my family who has bipolar. So how can that be? And and that that's really essentially the answer. First of all, it's not entirely genetic. Second mm-hmm. of all, we all have some genetic vulnerability. And mm-hmm. so all it means if you don't have a family history is that everybody else in your family was lucky enough that their jar didn't fill all the way up to the top with an experiential or environmental things. It doesn't right. mean... That- yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So that's the. Idea. We, we also weren't very good at diagnosing bipolar disorder well, that, back yeah. then either. We're not that good now. Yeah. We've still got some ways to go. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think one of the things I like the most about this model, I think it is really important to people to understand, like, how did I get this? Because oftentimes, like, when somebody's developed, been diagnosed with something like bipolar. What I've learned over time is that people will often, and, and, and just full disclosure, like I live with a mood disorder myself. So I have depression, I have anxiety, and I also have nightmare disorder. So the, the research work that I do is very, very personal to me. Mm-hmm. And I guess the reasons that it's so important to me to try and provide these kinds of answers for people is because they're the kinds of answers I would have wanted to have. Like, right. Mm-hmm. You know? And so, you know, I think when people have been diagnosed with something like depression, anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia, whatever, one of our first reactions is to tend to feel like, like we must be defective or different mm-hmm. or morally wrong or something, or, mm-hmm. like, you know, like we, we mm-hmm. did something wrong that meant that we deserve punishment or like we could have done, we could have taken better care of ourselves to prevent it, you know, prevent this in some way, you know? Self blame, self stigma. Yeah. yeah. All of that stuff, all of that stuff. And so I think that, you know, it is really important to understand like how these things happen because by having a really good evidence based, research based, you know, explanation for why. We've, we've found that actually we can reduce people's feelings of guilt and that sort of thing, which is super cool. But it gets even better, you know, because we can use this model to help people understand not only how did they get sick in the first place, but how we can better protect our mental health for the future. And so that's what I like the most about this model. So can I show you that stuff? Yeah, I'm okay. glad to see that stuff. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is the bit that I love the most. So in the context of this jar analogy that we're talking about, there are things that we refer to as being protective factors. And so what they do in the context of this model is they stack on top of the jar, making it taller so that Mm. the jar can accommodate more experienced stuff or environmental stuff without getting full. So you can't change the amount of genetic vulnerability in your jar. We talked about that, right? And that's what this picture is showing again. You can't change the amount of orange balls. And we're going to talk about what you can do to change some of those blue pyramids, the environment stuff in a minute. But I think what I like even more than that is the protective factors, which make the jar taller so you can fit more things in it, basically. Because remember, the jar has to be full in order for you to be actively experiencing an episode of illness. Right. So, yeah. So first of all, like, Even if you've experienced a first episode of something, you've experienced a period of mania, you've experienced a period of depression, that means your jar was full, right? For lots of people, including me, right, I'm not depressed today. I'm not currently depressed, which is awesome, frankly. Mm 
So that means that my jar, although it has looked like the one on the far left, it's not looking like that right now. Okay. So how, d- how does it get from this, this state to a state where it's not full all the way to the top? There's a couple of ways that we can make that happen. One is by removing some of these envir- these blue pyramids from the jar. And that can be more or less difficult depending on what the blue things are we're talking about, right? So, you know, so for example, in some, for some conditions that are psychiatric, there's really good evidence, for example, that if you experience a, a che- uh, bleh, excuse me, a head injury in childhood, that right. can increase your risk for some kinds of psychiatric conditions in later life, like schizophrenia, for example, mm. right? We cannot go back in time and change the fact that that happened, right? Right, that, yeah. The blue thing that's in the jar, right? Uh, I was in the example that, or possibility running through my head was childhood abuse or neglect, yeah. right? That isn't something that we have any control over, but can really, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so some of those things are not things that we can go back and change the fact that they happen to us. We cannot, mm-hmm. right? There may be, there are things, of course, that we can do in terms of like mm, e- easing the effect that they have on us in a date, like if we're lucky enough to have a therapist and that sort of thing that we can work through some of that trauma with, then that can be a super helpful thing. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, so there are some things that are just blue triangles that are in your jar. That's it. Right. Right. But sometimes there might be some blue triangles that we can think about trying to remove. Examples would be stuff like if you're in a current situation, which is highly stressful, there may be some circumstances for some lucky people where you can remove yourself from that environment. Please know I am not diminishing the significance of what I'm talking about. I am not. But it, you know, it, for some people in some circumstances, that can be possible. Can you give yeah. us a concrete example of Yeah, for sure. Like, let's say we're in a work situation where we're just feeling like really devalued, really overstretched, really, you know, dehumanized by what you're doing. If you're fortunate enough, you might be able to look for and find an alternative place of employment where you don't feel like a human cog, you know, where you feel, where you feel like, you know, a valued, valued member of society who's part of, you know, contributing something valuable. So, so that would be an example. Another example would be, you know, we, you talked about trauma and abuse, Erin, you know, sometimes, you know, we find ourselves in abusive relationships as adults. So removing yourself from a situation like that is profoundly difficult, profoundly difficult. But yet, if if one is able to, then that obviously can be a way in which you know you know it's it's a way to a clear clearer skies for for many many things essentially. Mm-hmm. So those would be some examples. However, as we've been discussing, removing some of the some some of those blue things aren't going anywhere because you can't do anything about them. And some of the things are really difficult to remove. So and that all feels really kind of depressing, frankly. Mm-hmm. Um, so what so so great. So then what kind of thing? Well, that's the good bit. That's why I love the protective factors so much. Because what that's about is instead of trying to remove the things that are making the jar full, we're adding tall, you know, tallness. <laughs> we're adding capacity to the jar you know what i mean we're making space in the jar in a different way yeah um, it's a strengthening and resiliency wow. kind of model right yeah exactly so you know we use example examples of protective factors would be things that we've got really good evidence for like you know good quality regular sleep yeah uh, social support mm-hmm. really important Regular good quality nutrition, if you can, right? Exercise. Exercise. That. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then, you know, and then for people like me who've been diagnosed with a psychiatric condition and who are lucky enough to find a medication that works for them, then medication can be a really profoundly important ring on top of that jar. That's how I ex- I'm lucky enough to experience my medication. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so through all of these, di- and, and obviously finding more effective ways to manage the stress that we experience can be a really good protective factor too. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things that we can do to add these rings on top of our jar to make it taller so it can, com- it can accommodate more of this environmental stuff without getting full. And I think that is really like 
it's really empowering. It makes me feel, knowing that makes me feel like there are things I can do and I'm not just a victim of whatever is going on in my, in my brain, you know, with, with my depression. I don't, I know, I, I want people to know this, right? I am not saying, nobody is saying, it's incorrect to say that anybody has the power to prevent an episode of mental illness. No, that's not it. This is literally just about reducing the chance, essentially, mm -hmm. right? There's nothing foolproof here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so this is no cast iron guarantee, but these are just things that, that, that we can employ that are sort of low risk, if you like, that we know work and that combined in my experience can make a really, you know, positive difference to, to how we manage these things.